Welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you're joining us today. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest, Reverend Dr. Tiffany Barsotti. She's a spiritual and medical intuitive counselor and subtle energy specialist teaching Know Thyself tools for achieving clarity of life, purpose, spiritual maturity, and healing psycho-spiritual, emotional, energetic root causes of illness. Her recent book, The Biology of Transformation, The Physiology of Presence and Spiritual Transcendence, was full of wonderful wisdom, and we'll be hearing about that today. Tiffany, it is such a great pleasure to have you joining us today. Welcome. Mm, thank you, Helene. It's so awesome to finally be face-to-face -face with you. It's been many years of being in similar circles, but haven't had our own time yet. So I'm excited for this. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's just dive into this incredible work that you've been doing around healing. Can you share with us what you call the first key for true healing? Yeah, um, I, I just I want to ground our our space and welcome people who are are listening, and that when we're grounded, we can actually step into this first key a little more easily with this resonance idea, and this um, for I, to set this up as well. I'd like to say, what do three keys ha of healing have to do with the science of healing? And everything that I'm going to share is what I have found in my clinical practice for the last 20 some years, cases that I may not have written up or published, but certainly in my conscious awareness, people are in my conscious awareness as these kind of themes. And something that also blends in with this is one of my teachers was uh, direct teachers with Carolyn Mace for many years. And she wrote a, a beautiful book of uh, why people don't heal and how they can. And there, as I was putting these details together, I was like, wow, this is really similar to some of the things that Carolyn Mace was putting out in that book. And it's worded a little bit differently and more simplistically, but essentially the, the foundations are, are not just only my findings. It's also findings that I know in other colleagues of medical intuitives as well. So just wanted to set the stage for that. So to answer that, actually, I would love to, to show a, a cartoon that kind of looks at this opportunity to be able to how we can see resonance, how it would show up. So let me share these slides. Resonance, I, I just really appreciated this cartoon. Uh, when we think about resonance, so for those that can't see it, just imagine that you've got two doctors looking at a single patient and the, the, the name or the title of the cartoon is the world and the way it would be if music and medicine were more closely linked. And these two doctors, one is looking at the other doctor saying, I can cure that illness in three notes. So when we speak about coherence and resonance and, and these things, it's not only just about sound in, in the way that we think about sound bringing healing, but also in what creates the conditions of having a sound mind, the, the, the conditions that allow for healing to happen in our bodies. And resonance being the first key Probably it makes sense to define this a little bit. So I'm using the physics definition to state when one object vibrating at the same natural frequency of a second object forces that second object into vibrational motion. So it's a match. And it's if you can imagine one guitar string being plucked, an A, then on a guitar across the room, the A vibration of that string would also resonate with on that string. So it's a fascinating phenomena that happens. And what I have found in my, my clinical practice of what, what does this really mean? So my definition that I have found is it's a reverberation in the field that creates an attraction type force in order to resolve itself in a matching vibration. So even to unpack that further is to say that 
resonance is neither our friend or foe. It just is. And the resonance can create the problem as much as it can solve it. So we attract things to our lives. And I very much see that it has to do with our soul's path and what it is that we are needing to experience on our life in our lives path for maybe fate destiny kind of point of view. And then when we're in the right mind, mental, emotional, well-being kind of mindset that we can allow the resonant answer to be able to also come in. So that's kind of what I'm I'm meaning by the first key. Can you share a little bit more about what you mean by resonance? Because from what you just shared, I can think about this in terms of the physical body and the cells resonating with each other on a very physical level, or I can think of it perhaps interrelationally, like myself and my family or my coworkers and resonating with people around me. Can you share a little bit more about that, especially in terms of healing or not healing? Yeah. So if we think about that, how it is that we attract certain things, it, it's we, you know, we don't choose consciously our family, but we very much put it in motion when we're in the ethers and and sort of waiting to come to earth. And so, you know, some people will will say, "Oh my God, I I created this. I created my family connection." It's like I don't know that. Well, and some people are like, wow, I chose really well. So there's, there are conditions that, that happen in one's life that set us up. It, I, I like to sometimes call it a high self setup that where we get into these certain situations, relationships, and there's, there's a great saying, you spot it, you got it. And that's the resonance. And that can be like, oh, that person's super critical or judgmental, or that person is so loving and, and what warmth comes from them. And, and so there's, there, it can be both. It can be either one. This is what I mean about there's a neutrality with it. It's almost like the brain plasticity. It's, it's, not, your, it's not necessarily your friend. It's part of the function of life. And so what we do with it, is is essentially whether or not it creates healing or creates dissonance and a lack of coherence in our lives. Yes, and so understanding, just having the awareness of that resonance is essentially what you're saying is the first key, which I think is so incredibly powerful. What about the next key in tree healing? Yeah, so the next key, what I like to say is really the discovery process. So the next key is um, really related to the conditions of mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And let me uh, also share. So the, the key to, we could actually call it the discovery phase of what's actually going on in our process. It's almost like a decoding. Why is my body giving me this message if it's a physical thing? Why am I constantly in a state of anxiety? There's an incredible wisdom that the body and the, the natural intelligence that is inborn, and it gets our attention symbolically through injuries or illnesses or other experiences. And so this is our opportunity to stop, look, and listen and say, okay, I've put some things in motion clearly. And now what? <laughs> now, what, what is the, this signal that my body is giving me? And, you know, uh, chronic illnesses and, and things like that, you know, that means that something's been there for quite a while. And what I have found is really all healing is self-healing. And to have an awareness of what our body's wisdom is and get in touch with the symbology of what is actually happening. And um, Mace always said also that healing happens in present time. The stressors are in the future or in the past, but they can also be part of 
what it is that's causing the unrest and the messages that may still need to be unpacked from our, our physical experience and our mental emotional experience, our spiritual experience, our energetic experience. So it's um, only can collisions that find resonant match get to resolve. It's, it's, it's a like attracts like. And, and so that's where the resonance plays that role as well. Like, okay, I attracted this to me. People who do profound healing are people who say, this happened for me, not to me. They're not stepping into a victim mindset. Those are, are people that tend to recreate the, the chronic conditions, the ones who are stuck in victim and, uh, or, you know, chronically on the drama triangle of victim, rescuer, persecutor, and just kind of chasing that dynamic around, whether it be in family or other relationships. That's incredible because, you know, many of us are running around very busy. We have all this external stimulation. And so you're saying this, just the simple process of stop, look, and listen to be aware of what's happening with ourselves is part of this healing process, which I so absolutely resonate with because often what'll happen is we're running around with our heads cut off and then, oh no, now comes pain in my body. And so can you explain how this arising of the physical ailment is connected to the mental and emotional experience? Yeah, absolutely. So isn't it so true that our body just really gives us messages when, uh, you know, let's say emotionally, something just did a drive by on me and I didn't quite catch it the first time. And then it, or, you know, it's kind of like this repeat thing that it tends to usually get our attention. And, and then we can be able to say, oh my gosh, that's familiar to me. I'm in the same situation, maybe different people, but same situation. And I'm, I, I've got, you know, or, um, Let's let's just choose a, a body part. A couple come to mind: knees, toes, legs. Ha wanting to move forward, there's a certain amount of symbolism within the biofield or within the body's natural anatomy that is giving us clues about moving forward. Even I, I just consulted with a client recently who he was driving somebody else's car, and they got rear-ended, and. So what's going on in his life is he's in the middle of a divorce, but he's dragging it because he's, he's this kind of person that is super uncomfortable with confrontation. So he's not moving things forward. Meanwhile, all these beautiful things are trying to happen in his life. And so the rear ending, this is the symbology of, you know, it's like move on uh, or somebody that hits their head on a frequent basis. It's like, wake up and, and <laughs> put the message. So there's this symbolism in, you know, even as we might be, find ourselves even accident prone or cutting ourselves with knives, there may be a need to slow down, you know, just listening to and paying attention to what is in our sphere of awareness. What am I attracting to myself and what is my body actually trying to say? Because our body doesn't usually, our body doesn't say, hey, I need more sleep until you come to the awareness of something that is actually saying, wow, I, I've become an insomniac and that's because I'm addicted to, to television at night or I'm drinking caffeine too late or whatever the, the, the outside stimulus may be, or just the mental, emotional stress of things that are going on. So yeah, that stop, look, listen, pay attention to the symbolism that is all around us and inside us. You know, sometimes when people hear this, they can take it in a, it's my fault type attitude. So, you know, if my mental emotional is somehow causative of my physical illnesses or these diagnoses, mm -hmm. it's that fine line between feeling empowered by it and feeling uh, to blame or guilt or shame about it. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I want to make sure we're really clear about that for the audience. Yeah, thank you, Helena. It's such an important point. Um, I, I really do like this this concept of sitting with. Okay, I, if you can get yourself to a point, because it's hard to sit with the fact that I attracted this. I I I brought this to me. It's hard to sit in that sometimes. 
But that actually turns on the responsibility ele element in our lives to say, okay, really, if, if I allow myself to, I, it's not about fault finding, it's not about blame, it's not about even trying to control the situations. Because by the way, that's the drama triangle again, is the blame and the control game. It's like looking for somebody to blame and those things can be very subtle. And this is why I have this, or this is, we're always looking to cast off a responsibility because it's more comfortable to, than, to do that than it is to take ownership. So, and, and just, it's okay. We all, that's the human condition. This is part of learning the landscape of knowing ourselves of, gosh, why is it that I am, I am always getting injured or I'm always attracting these same types of relationships in my life? There's something there to unpack that it's intended to teach us. And a really poignant question that I ask clients and that I offer in my classes is, uh, is the important question is, what was I intending to teach myself in this situation? And just once again, it's that stopping and looking from a different perspective. Because what's the famous say saying that um, Einstein says, you can't solve a problem with the same mindset that actually brought you the problem. It's being able to shift into a different gear. The answers usually come in on a different frequency than the questions get broadcast on. Yes, absolutely. Can you, you shared one example, which was really, I think, helped bring it home. Can you share other examples of this connection with past clients and results? Sure. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, one, one, Two people, a couple of conditions come to mind. I had two women. They're almost identical to each other. It was uncanny to me. They had cervical cancer, ovarian and cervical cancer. And this really actually comes into point number three that we'll get into about the, the healing, the healing, the key to healing for number three. But these two women, and I couldn't believe they were in my practice at the same time. They both had a second recurrence of cervical ovarian cancer. Kind of, it was it was kind of both for for them. They both said, "This time, I am not going to do it your way." They would say this to their doctor. This time. I, I need to take things into my own hands because I paid attention and I gave you my power instead of me. I never wanted to do the recommendations that you gave me the first time, but I did it because I felt like that was what I had to do. And there was this disconnect from their own creative power, sacral region of the body in their own creative power. Oh, I get chills when I speak about this again. You <laughs> and these two women, uh, this this actually makes me emotional. These two women died. And and it was it was too far. The the treatments they, they didn't have a chance to actually really use their own creative power. And both of them said, if I had this to do over again. I would not have done all of those things. Now, I am not giving medical advice to anybody here. I'm not saying if you have ovarian or cervical cancer, by all means, you need to follow your own resonant guidance. What I'm speaking to is that they, these, both of these women were out of their own resonance with what they and their bodies wanted at, because they gave their power. And, and the sacral center is a will center as well as the solar plexus, as well as the throat. These are power centers within the body for how we make decisions in our lives. So you brought up empowerment earlier, and that's very much related to that as well. That's amazing. You alluded to a third key. That was a nice teaser. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. The third key is Activating your own inner healer. We, whatever you can, you consider that to be, whether it's some people, there's some osteopaths that I, I love working with and they say, you know, turn on your own inner physician. 
what is it that your own inner physician say, says? Because we all have this innately. And when, when we talk about when what's really going to activate this inner knowing, and we can sometimes be in an argument with ourselves. Let me just say this straight away. First hit, best hit. Your first mind, the first answer that comes is usually the correct one. So that's just a pearl to, as a takeaway. And when life gets messy, there's a transformation that is underway. So we want that, that transformation to ultimately be taking place, but that's usually when things are coming unglued and the way out is through. So this is where I say resonance over research. Oh, this is kind of juicy. Uh, this is something that just dawned on me the other day in looking at all of this beautiful new research, you know, that's, that's coming out from Dispenza's group and what my husband, Paul Mills, was doing with the, the Cho with Deepak Chopra and the Chopra Center for the Self-Directed Biological Transformation, where they were looking at all these different factors and variables that allowed people to really get well. And this research is fabulous. But if it's not within your own resonance, if you're not finding that chord within yourself that says, yes, this is a match to me, my suggestion here is that resonance win in our personal sovereignty over what the research says. Because re research is, is a way of observing and in the way of doing science that is phenomenal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing for you. And the, both of these women that I just gave an example of it wasn't until they were in their second recurrence of their healing where there was some new advantages in genetic medicine. And then they were started, started being treated as a unique person with their own genetic profile and started doing different kind of immunotherapies and things like that. But like I said, so much had already happened in their bodies that it was a little too late. So we wanna, yes, get the information. Get the research. Be educated about what's going on. Don't bury your head in the sand. And also be aware of what it is that is resonant within one's body. What is it that, is, it, that actually feels coherently solvent to, to me in my own sovereignty? So we're not seeking validity outside ourselves, and we're actually honoring our personal sovereignty. And this, this third key really is about when the, the solution is activating our own in, inner healer is, and, and that's actually, I gave a bonus for this summit of a meditation of, uh, for meeting the inner healer. So if this is kind of a foreign concept to anybody, hopefully that guided process will be of assistance. This accessing our inner and latent powers, it's within all of us. And the, the salutogenesis, which is a, a fancy way of saying that the body's ability to heal is innate. It's always looking for that place of homeostasis, but that's a dynamic process. I actually like to call it homeodynamic, but it really looks at the body's ability to self-heal. So once we make the decision that this is my resonant direction in life in which to go, we can really turn on our own salutogenesis. And that means the self-regeneration. That is the body's normal way of being. And, and even if there's a genetic disorder, that was part of the etheric template from a karmic uh, arrangement, something that we all wrote into motion w before we got here. So making peace with that as well, which would be really important. So it's about building an inner trust and a holistic interconnection with ourselves. And if we're not trusting ourselves, then there's usually work that, that needs to be done prior to that. But that's an important piece. That's so profound. There are so many nuggets in there. One is about this resonance over research. So the way research is done is really about generalizability and trying to find inference about large groups of people altogether. So it's the complete opposite of individualized medicine. And obviously there's huge benefit to that, to understanding it, but we need to take it for what it is. 
It is not individual advice necessarily. So I think that's an incredibly important point. And the other point I want to highlight that you shared is that this inner healer is within all of us. Mm -hmm. And being able to access it is available to everyone. Mm -hmm. So now that you've kind of shared all these three keys for us, what do you think is the next step for people to step into their uh, true healing in their life if they're ready? Yeah. Uh, allow that. And, and what you just spoke to about seeing this resonance over research, uh, allow that uniqueness that is within our personality to bloom and, and use that as a discovery process and an opportunity to know ourselves more and more deeply. The Temple of Apollo at, at Delphi, that's what it is. Uh, it says, you know thyself and nothing in excess. And, and there's another third point too, but this finding our own balances, but really knowing thyself is a life's work. And this, this is the point of key number two is allow this discovery process. Like it, don't just let it, um, just these events or things do a drive-by on us. Unpack what it really means. And, and I'll say this, Norm Sheely was one of my uh, direct mentors for five and a half years. And um, he's such a, a hoot. I, I love him. And he would say, if something happened when we were in the midst of our studies, he would say, oh, we, we need to do a past life on that. And I'm like, oh, God, Norm, please, really? <laughs> Do I really need to go unpack the past life? It's like, no, just sit with ourselves and realize, all right, what's the message that is coming from my body? What is it that wants to be conveyed? And I'm not saying get overly um, cautious or, but find that, that balance within ourselves of, okay, I, I'm seeing this as a pattern within my life. And, and even if it's not a pattern, even if it's, this is one-off, like I was saying about this person that got rear-ended, hopefully he's not getting rear-ended every day. Hopefully that, that one experience will be enough to like be a catalyst. And that's actually what our body selves. We actually have a subconscious self that, that we call the body self. And that's, that's using language from personal self-integration. But this body self has this great wisdom and but it doesn't speak in language. It speaks in symbols. So what is it? You know, sometimes we use numbers. Sometimes we use um, symbols out in the native traditions. First, First Nations people, indigenous cultures, they very much have this natural relationship with, I'm going to go to the water and I'm just going to listen to what the, the brook sounds like today, what the spring sounds like today. I'm going to put my feet in that water and get the and receive the message of what is is meant for me at this time. It's they have this innately in their culture to take a time out and use the situations and things that come up almost as a rite of passage. That's a good way to say it actually. These kinds of experiences could be a rite of passage. That's incredible. So you shared so many gems with us today. Thank you so much. Considering everything that you've shared, what do you think is the most empowering take-home message about health and healing for our audience? Probably that, which I just last said about really taking time in the busyness. We all have more information coming at us than we've ever had. We have less time in which to digest it. And giving ourselves that time out, giving ourselves that permission to listen. How are, how is the wind moving through? Listen to the elements. What's the fire saying? What, what's the wind saying? What's the water saying? You know, when it's beautiful snowing outside or is it hailing? There's, there's messages in, in our weather. There's, you know, hailing could be seen as more of a purging versus a soft snow that feels more purifying. And so this kind of just being in a rhythm and allowing that rhythm to have its way with us. And the last point that I would like to say for just a, a, a message to leave for everyone is that when you go to sleep at night, 
send a little ping to your inner physician, inner healer. Just sit with a question of, I'd like to connect with you and I'd like to know more information about fill in the blank. And amazing things happen in hypnagogic and hypnopompic moments. The moments before we're just falling asleep in that twilight and the twilight as we're waking up. There's great wisdom that comes in in those times. And so when we set that intention and that tone at that, those moments before falling asleep, the, the mind goes to seek for these answers. The mind doesn't like actually open questions. It likes for there to be certainty and, and organization to things. So it comes. I'm so aligned with that and a huge proponent of the power of intention. So thank you for leaving us with that beautiful gift. And thank you so much for all these uh, this gems of wisdom that you've shared with us about health and healing. Deeply grateful for your time today. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Helene.